Welcome back, everyone. I want everyone to repeat after me. God is good. God is good. Now say it like you mean it. God is good. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, for our announcements today, we will be singing softly, please. Um, turn off your Wi-Fis. We're, gonna, we're still streaming Facebook Live. Hi, Darla up in the rafters. Um, yard signs. Does everyone have their yard signs? Need a yard sign? Know someone that needs a yard sign? Get with Sherry in the office and she will hook you up with one. Um, if everyone hasn't, um, we're requesting that you get with Sherry in the office and update phone numbers. Um, numbers change over time, so we're trying to get those updated. Um, we want to thank everyone for watching on Facebook Live. Um, Facebook Live has gotten, I know myself, and a lot of other people through this time. So um, if everyone wants to turn around, look up Eric Darla, give her a wave, let everyone know we're here. God is good. Um, also, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we will be Facebook Live and in person at 7 p.m. on those three events. So keep that in mind. Invite a friend. And we have more announcements. Today is one great hour of sharing offering for the UCC. Please find an, an envelope in your bulletin today and consider giving what you can. The church office has reopened to the public. No more knocking on the door or calling. Masks, social distancing, and one person at a time allowed in the office. That's out of respect for Sherry. Thank you, Sherry, for all you do. Um, talked about yard signs. Um, in case, has, has everyone seen the yard signs yet? All right, Nancy just said there's, there's some out in the North X. Um, you know, the sign perfectly states what, what, what we at EUCC believe. Progressive, inclusive, affirming, welcoming. We choose love like Jesus. God is good. And last but not least, Easter flower orders. We are taking flower orders for our sanctuary to be beautifully decorated for Easter Sunday. We are unsure of what plants will be available due to the pandemic. Please see the order form in your bulletin today. To place a plant in memory or in honor of a loved one, fill out the form and send or take it along with your payment to the church office. Orders must be turned in no later than Monday, March 29th. Everyone who orders may take a plant after worship on Easter Sunday. So keep that in mind. And now we are going to turn to hymn number 147 and sing softly, verses one and four. How great thou art.
remain standing for our call to worship. And it is okay if you feel comfortable to respond. Beloved in Christ, why have you come to worship this morning? This love reaches through the shadows of our lives to embrace us. Our challenge is to trust the light of God's love in the midst of our struggles. If only we will trust, Jesus leads us in the way of light and love. You may be seated. Our prayer of reconciliation is a responsiveness today, and again, if you feel comfortable, you may respond. O oh God of comfort and God of challenge, we come to you this morning the way the Israelites did, full of complaints and dissatisfaction. Nothing is enough. We do not recognize your blessing at work in our day-to-day -day lives. And you are blessed because God's image resides deep within each of you. So return God's blessing by the way you love one another. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed in the last month or so, I've tried to do an Old Testament reading as well as um, the scripture. And today... Uh, you'll be hearing a little bit about the Old Testament in my message. But today's Old Testament reading comes from Numbers, the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Or, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil may not be exposed but those who do what is true come to light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God.
all practical purposes, it has been a year since we have gathered in here. Yeah, I know that we have met briefly for five weeks in the fall. The last two weeks, I don't think we could count because cases got so bad that there was a handful of people. That's probably stretching it. But this is many people's holy place. And I want us to be able to gather our hearts and our minds and to be able to focus and do something a little bit different than a prayer before my message. So what I want you to do is I want you to just relax, settle into your seats. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a deep breath. And let it out slowly. What comes to mind? Where are you mentally? And I want you to imagine that you're in the presence of Jesus. And to know that Jesus is the glimmer of light and hope. What does that light look like? Stay there for a moment with Jesus. Focus on the glimmer of light and hope that is to come. For God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten child. For God so loved the world that God gave. For God so loved the world. For God so loved. So loved. The world. God. Amen. Reading for this week's message, I came across the term analytical acumen. And when I read this word, I thought to myself, well, there's a $10 word. I have no clue what it means. Analytical Acumen means the ability to visualize, articulate, and solve both complex, uncomplicated problems or concepts. It's the ability to make recommendations that are sensible, based on available information, sound judgments, and enable quick decisions. And I immediately thought, for those who really look in the bulletin to see what I title my sermons, that is perfect. And then they're going to say, well, what have you been partaking during COVID and writing sermons? But there's other examples of this analytical acumen in the Bible. Like Noah and the flood. God dividing the Red Sea for the Israelites to pass through. Young David slaying Goliath. Yeah, we believe these things happen, but some of us would really want to have some concrete scientific evidence to explain these events and why these events really did happen. But honestly, the greatest analytical acumen is why did Jesus die on the cross? What happened at the cross? How exactly did Jesus' crucifixion 2,000 years ago secure salvation for humanity? Which theology of atonement is the correct one? Honestly, I've spent many years agonizing over these questions. Because the version of atonement that I was taught growing up has fallen way apart from me. You know, the one that I was taught that said that Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for me, 
absorbing all my wickedness into his body. And I've honestly been scrambling to try to come up with a new one. The problem has been that I felt like that I really had to nail down a real and concrete reason as to why Jesus died on the cross. You know, this extravagant show of love and grace and mercy and compassion, all through pain and death, I really felt that it really wouldn't work unless I could concretely pin down and figure it out. But thankfully, I no longer believe this. I know that it's not lazy, it's not wishy-washy to approach the cross with all rather than having to solve this very complex mystery. I don't have to have this true and concrete answer about Jesus dying on the cross. It's not because my curiosity is wrong, but because all of the other explanations of God's saving work may be partially and incomplete. What the cross offers is simply overabundance, a vast richness of meanings, approaches, angles, ideas, and truths. The gift that God gave us at Calvary was contemplation, not the gift of perfect comprehension. So we find ourselves in this fourth week of Lent. And the lectionary today offers one, one approach, one way of asking what happened at the cross. Again, it's not the only way, it's not exhaustive, it's not exclusive. But it's a very compelling and challenging way as well as it is beautiful. And I'm grateful to have this option among many options. We'll try and figure this out first through our Old Testament reading in Numbers, and then we'll look at John's Gospel. If you remember in the Old Testament, the Israelites had really lost patience. Yet, they've been in the desert, they're speaking out against God and Moses, and they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt into this simply to die in the wilderness, they ask. There's no food, there's no water, and what little food we have, it is awful. So this is the last complaint in a series of complaints. But if you remember in all the other complaints, God has responded to the Israelites with compassion and grace. When they complained that the drinking water was bitter, God added a little sweet. When they grumbled about being hungry, God rained down manna on them. Then when they were completely out of water and couldn't find any, they had Moses, God had Moses to strike a rock and there was water. Then they complained about the meat. There ain't no meat. So what did God do? He had quail flying to their camp. I guess this time God has said, had enough. Because this response was not compassionate. It had it with the complaint. So according to the text, God answers their well, I want to really go back to save slavery because at least I got some food. It was a wine fest. They were just whiners. So what did God do? God sends all, sends all these snakes into camp. They bite some people and some people die. Well, that got their attention, right? So what happened then? He said, hmm, Moses, you need to pray to God and say, we're sorry, we didn't mean it. 
But you see, it's an inconvenient story that raises very thorny questions about sin and judgment. And it's okay to wrestle with it. But for the purposes of approaching the cross and the atonement, I want to focus on what happens next. Because then God instructs Moses to build this serpent out of something. And he says, if you can get these people who have been bitten to look at it, they're going to be okay. So they looked at it, and they lived. Now, fast forward several centuries, and you have Nicodemus who has approached Jesus. And when did Nicodemus come to Jesus? In the night. And if you remember, Nicodemus was a very smart uh, religious scholar. So when he does approach Jesus under the cover of that night, they enter into this very long and crazy dialogue about birth and light and spirit and belief itself. And at one point in the conversation, Jesus refers back to that ancient text in Numbers because he knows that Nicodemus knows that story inside and out. He says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Yeah, and we may think that that's a very odd comparison. The Messiah and a, stat and a bronze statue of a snake. What does it all mean? I wonder if it means something about perspective, about seeing, about casting our eyes in a new and less comfortable direction. See, in the Old Testament, God was always having the Israelites to look up, to gaze without flinching at the very thing that sin had brought them. God wanted to, to see what was causing all that. It is the thing that they really feared the most. The thing that will surely kill them if God doesn't intervene with grace and compassion. It was the instrument of pain and death that actually led to healing in life. See, in order to be saved, the people had to confront the snake. They had to look at, very, look at it very hard, what was literally harming them, what was poisoning them, what was breaking them, what killed some of them. And it's really hard for sometimes to wonder what kind of love that will save because Sometimes in order to be saved by love, we must first be wounded. Hence comes the bronze snake, which forces the people to stare at the poison that was causing them grief and anger. And it was the unending judgment of a merciful God whose love is vast, but at that time was tough, deep, and also demanding. It's a love that exposed the truth. And we all know the truth hurts sometimes. And it's a love that will deliver, and at the same time, it invites us to change our own perspective. So what does a story about a snake on a pole have to do with Jesus on the cross? So for those of us who have trouble to reconcile God's will about the death of the Son, perhaps this story offers us a way in. It was the will of God that Jesus declare and embody the coming of God's kingdom, a divine kingdom of peace 
of restorative justice, of radical and universal love, grace, freedom, and hope. It was a kingdom without violence, without oppression, without exploitation, without greed. In short, it was a kingdom dramatically unlike our all too broken, all too human world that Jesus was actually born into. So why did Jesus die? He died because he unveiled the ungracious sham at the heart of all human kingdoms. He held up a mirror to those people and it shocked them what they saw. And it shocks us today at our deepest levels and of our own imagination if we'll just hold the mirror up to ourselves. In other words, Jesus unveiled the poison. He showed us the snake. He revealed what our own human kingdoms will always become unless we look at God and God's mercy then can deliver us. In the cross, we're forced to see what we and our own refusal to love, our indifference to suffering, our craving for violence, our resistance to change, our hatred of indifference, our, in, our addiction to judgment, and our fear of the other. We must destroy this poison. The bronze snake of Moses' time was not magical. It was not meant to be idolized. Neither is the cross. Not during our Lenten season are we to idolize the cross. But what the cross does is invites us to look up, to reorient ourselves, and to depend, depend wholly on God to bring life out of death. Light out of darkness and healing out of pain. Then the cross functions as a sacrament, a mean of grace, a path of the vine. It reminds us that belief, it's much more than a cognitive exercise. To believe in the power of the cross is to rely on Jesus for our very lives. It is to trust and to lift up Jesus because Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only anti-venom. Jesus is our only means of rescue. Yeah. The cross of Christ is a mystery, and it should be. Among many other things, it's a stunning paradox of sorrow and hope, judgment and mercy, despair and healing, brokenness and hope. But I want you to know, it's okay not to understand. That is the invitation to see. So look up. Don't be afraid. Don't refuse the pain. Don't turn away. Simply look up and be saved. Amen. Before we pray, I want us to lift up our custodian, Dina Harps. Um, her, her husband, Joe, lost his battle with cancer last night about 9 o'clock. Um, she and I have had several conversations over the past few days, and her myriad of emotions, 
She knows that he is at peace, but nonetheless it hurts. And I say that because you're probably going to see her back to normal very quickly because I truly believe that when she cleans, that is her therapy. So allow her therapy to take place. May we pray. Holy God, it's been a long time since we've been in this building. This brick, this mortar that we call a church. And we are thankful for this opportunity. We are thankful to be gathered here with people who find this their holy place. Yet, during the past year, we have found that our holy place can be anywhere, for you are always near. But it is good to gather back in person. It is good that vaccines are increasing. It is good that overall cases are going down. It is good that slowly and surely we are getting back to regaining our busy lives. However, God, I ask for your patience because we're not quite there yet. We still have to mask. We still have to social distance. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. And holy God, I ask for you to be with Dina as she's struggling with the loss of her husband. And this pandemic has seen a lot of loss. Losses that were very unexpected. Losses that we can't get back. But because of each other and because we are your people. You will give us the strength, the patience, the courage, the hope, and the compassion to find victory. And I ask you now to pray the prayer that Jesus taught with saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. If any of you missed it coming in, there's uh, buckets in the North X for offerings. Consider the steadfast love of God in every breath you breathe. May that steadfast love inspire you to give generously so that we may live into God's reign of peace and compassion through the offerings of our own church. And oh, generous one, we give thanks for your steadfast love. It endures forever. And may these gifts be used to feed the hungry and satisfy the thirst of those you love throughout creation. Amen. We will now take part in our Holy Communion. Again, it is responsive. And if you feel comfortable, you may respond. Luke, the evangelist, wrote of our risen Savior, who at the table with his two disciples took bread, blessed it, and broke it. And he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized the risen Christ, 
and the breaking of the bread. God is with you. And also with you. Open wide your hearts. And we open them up to God. Holy God, our loving Creator. Close to us is breathing in the distance and far as possible. We thank you for your constant love, for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life. especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, and resurrection. We take courage from the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst. with mystics, martyrs, prophets, priests, and all the saints of light, we glorify you, say, Let us continue responsively in our prayer. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us one household, the church, your servant people, that we may be salt and light and leaven for the furtherance of your kingdom of the world. The gift of God for the people of God. Come from the west and come from the east and from the south and from the north, for the table is ready. If you'll take your wafer out of your top portion, this is the bread of life. Take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. And also the cup, the cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance of Jesus. Will you join with me in our prayer? 
Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth in the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Chris, I'm standing, I'll just be <laughs> We're going to end each worship with Let There Be Peace on Earth. And the words are in your bulletin and Gary will play and we will sing softly.